Hey. Oh. <laughs> oh. Nice to see you. Thank and you. Yet again, another talk where I'm surprised that the guest is actually on. This is so. <laughs> Just well. a hello, everyone. Hello, uh, tribe. Beautiful people. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending where we are. We have Maureen Thorpe with us from the Yoga Barn in Glasgow. Uh, in November, we are going to talk about breast cancer. Uh, I'm going to introduce you, Maureen, for one second. It might take a bit longer than that. You have to be the most qualified yoga teacher I've ever met. Uh, Maureen is a Nashtanga and Atta yoga teacher. You're specialized, I have to read, in trauma grief, death, depression and anxiety, yoga for pregnancy, postnatal yoga, and yoga for marginalized communities. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just read what you told me. You said from your, first, your very first yoga class, you were aware that um, yoga was working at a deeper level and not just, you know, beyond the physical asanas, which is one of the eight limbs of yoga. And you got very interested in the healing practice of yoga. In 2017, your partner is diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. Mm -hmm. And years later, you are diagnosed with breast cancer. And so this is what we're going to discuss today. We're going to discuss um, how those things happen to us, how to cope with them. And, um, and yeah, I guess that's the essence of it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank you. Would, you. would you tell us about your own journey then, Maureen? Okay. Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me on today. And... Um, for that uh, lovely kind of accolade um, and it's interesting you know just even just thinking about that um, how far my journey has taken me in terms of first of all starting with a physical practice recognizing that um, it was working on a deeper level but then just wanting to explore different different aspects of yoga um, and when, and when I say yoga, I say it in the broadest sense, yoga, meditation, chanting, um, all became uh, part, part of my routine. Um, and, and doing yoga teacher training then um, brought the philosophy aspects into it. And I think that um, what yoga philosophy in particular did for me was um, brought me to that sense that yoga was bigger than the personal, although it was about self-inquiry. It was really about community and about connecting to nature, to connecting to the bigger universe. Um, and I think maybe even as somebody that was brought up with um, a traditional Christian religion that I had kind of fallen away from, that yoga then gave me a sense of something greater than me. And that was something that really served me when life got difficult. Um, so I had been a yoga teacher for a number of years and I was actually... It was interesting, well, when Donald um, took very ill very quickly, it was just after we came back from a yoga retreat. Um, and at that point, I had signed up to do a course for teaching yoga for anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> I went on that course whilst Donald was in hospital and actually recognised every single box that was ticked about anxiety applied to me. Um, and although I was on the course for five days, I probably took in about 10% of what I would normally be able to take in. That didn't worry me, though. I could see that all of, all of the things within it were great solutions. Um, and it was actually that course in particular that led me to do yoga therapy in its broadest sense. And, and, and the weirdest thing was that I, I took the course for anxiety while Donald was ill. Um, and... Because of my my yoga background and because of where my life was at, I felt as if I could help him. I couldn't help him the way the doctors could help him, but I could help him in, in different ways. And I could be present and not completely panic every time something went wrong. So um, Donald got out of hospital and um, we planned our wedding. Um, 
because we'd never get married because we didn't see any real need. You know, we were both a bit older and then all of a sudden it was just like, why don't we do this to celebrate life? That was it. Um, and we were, we'd planned the wedding at my yoga place. <laughs> um, I had been sick now. We're talking your partner. He had been sick for about two years at this point. Oh, or it was about two years, yeah. Um, and, and actually, he was a great example to me of, um, despite everything that happened to him, he also practiced yoga and was a yoga teacher. His resilience and looking forward and looking to what he could do rather than he couldn't do. Um, you know, he got back in his bicycle, even though I was terrified, and he, he managed that, went back to teaching yoga. And we thought we wanted to wait long enough for him to feel well to have the wedding. And it was about two months before the wedding that I got diagnosed with breast cancer. And, um, and it was weird because, you know, I was having a shower and I was just washing. And I felt a lump. And I knew without a doubt, I knew without a doubt that it was breast cancer. Um, two of my sisters had previously had breast cancer. Um, I've got a lot of sisters. I've got six sisters. And it was strange because I never felt panic. I just thought, this is a bit inconvenient right now. <laughs> I've got a lot to do here. But I also thought about other people and how it would be a shock for them. And immediately, and I think it is quite a female thing to think about, how will I tell people? How will I make them not worry so much? And um, But I knew I had to be honest about it because one of the patterns in my previous life was holding things in, trying to work things through by myself and not involving other people. And it didn't always work out well, and that's the absolute truth about that. Um, so um, I made sure that I was calm when I was speaking to other people. And then I went to see the doctor, even though I hadn't actually been formally diagnosed, um, I went to the doctor, um, got a quick appointment, and um, the doctor said, it's, this sounds suspicious, which is always a kind of way of saying, that's what I think, but I ha can't prove it. I was very lucky, um, I got to the hospital pretty quickly, got all the different um, biopsies, um, catch a scans and different things like that. So it was discovered that I had... Um, what they call triple negative breast cancer. There's there's about four different types of breast cancer. So despite the fact there's about 200 different types of known cancers, even within cancers, there's different, even without, within defined cancers, there's different cancers. And I thought triple negative sounded quite good. <laughs> um, but actually what they mean is it doesn't really respond to a lot of the conventional drugs. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I, in some ways, I was kind of heartened by that, although they did say it does respond very well to chemotherapy and to radiotherapy, but not the longer types of drugs like tamoxifen and some of the big drugs they take for years. So I took the positive out of that, that um, out of the surgery, because having done, I mean, we'd only done the module on breast cancer like three months before in yoga therapy, and I, you know, I could understand how how your blood reacts differently when you've got um, a cancer and your the, the way that blood cells die normally, bad blood cells die normally, doesn't happen with cancer. They multiply. Yeah. So my feeling was, I want to have this cancer out of my body and then I need time to think about what I'm doing. But I was quite clear that I did want to follow conventional medicine. And for me, I'm, I'm glad that I did. Um, but however... I also knew that um, there was there was another way to help me. Um, and I think I'd said to you when we chatted before, I had read um, Timothy McCall's book called Saving My Neck. He was a physician in America that got throat cancer. And he said, you know, you take the best of Western medicine because a lot has been learned and a lot of people recover from illnesses. But I think that one of the big takeaways that it took... That it, that it helped me to sort of work things out was Western medicine is designed to get rid of disease and it does it very well. Ayurvedic medicine and yoga is about how we can live the healthiest possible life. So to me, the blend, the, the perfect blend was taking what I needed from the, the Western medicine and then supplement it with everything that I possibly could in terms of Ayurveda, um, good herbs, good sleeping patterns, good yoga, meditation, chanting, all of the rest of it. And that did two things. Um, 
it meant that I didn't worry so much about the treatment that I was going to have because I knew it was going to be punishing. But it also gave me a sense of control of what was happening in my own body. And, you know, I've read a lot about people going through cancer treatments and feeling that immediately they're swallowed up by all the medical terms and what has been done to them. And it is a lot of it's been done to you. But for me, this was the, the, the kind of opposite. The, the lots is going to be done to me, but I've got some power and autonomy over how I do it. So that was where I started with it. Um, I want to rebound on this just a bit because you're, first of all, I'm interested. It's interesting, like, I guess I'm very interested in knowing what happens in your mind when mm -hmm. you're diagnosed. Yeah. What was that? Because yeah. I have to, like, obviously I have some friends. There, there was a, not so far, not so long ago, I think like four of my very good girlfriends were diagnosed with breast cancer. I should have said in this introduction that breast cancer, in the UK anyway, um, the last, I think, 2016 to 2018, there were 50,000 new cases diagnosed and actually a death rate of Uh, almost 20%, which is not the death rate like worldwide. But I mean, it's it's very heavy when you don't have it. You, as a woman, you feel like you've just gone gone, gone through the the nets, really. Like, oh, lucky me. <laughs> And I'm interested in everything that surrounds it. Like, when you're diagnosed, do you straight up think? Do you feel like okay? that's following on to me or do you link it straight to the emotional distrust and the hardship of the last two years caring for someone and do you do you look straight up into why why is it happening to me and what are the causes for that i or didn't i didn't away for me um is is because i'd kind of looked at it from the scientific perspective when i was just looking at it in yoga therapy it, it, that was interesting then i was looking much more at what are the, the potential causes um who might be more likely to to get breast cancer um but when it actually happened to me it, it was really strange because um i said i've got six six sisters two sisters who'd already had breast cancer and my first thought was Oh, I'm the third one. That's me. We, our family now make up the statistics almost. So almost like nobody else will get it in the family, which is totally ridiculous, really. But um, And one of my other friends I remember speaking to, and she said, I feel as if I'm just taking one for the team. So breast cancer is really common in women. Um, I think I didn't immediately look to the cause. I wasn't, I wasn't that surprised when I got it. I think it was, it, as I said, it was more like, this is bad timing. <laughs> and and I, do, I don't mean it, it, it quite as glibly as that, but for some reason, I didn't feel that afraid. Mm. It's interesting. And, and, it's, and it's, not everybody's, it's not everybody's experience. And I think one of the things that I do want to say, I can only really speak about my own experience. And I think that might be partly because I'm at a certain age that, a lot of other things have happened to me in my life and a lot of other challenging things that somehow have always kind of righted themselves. Um, Donald was, um, not just Donald, but Donald was a great inspiration to me. Somebody that, his, his illness was different. It, it, you know, it was necrotizing fasciitis. Yeah, Donald is your partner. I'm just, yeah. yeah. It's been, um, I, I, You no, know, there, there was days when it it wasn't we weren't sure whether he would live or not, and even for a few months it was touch and go. That that wasn't what happened to me. I felt that by the time that I got this, it was almost like I'm ready for this. I I know that I can deal with it, and 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 I don't want to make myself sound too brave. That that is just what happened. Because it happened that way. I didn't feel a real sense of panic and what if this and what if that. Um, I think it was much more stay level-headed. So I was almost like talking to myself. It was like a bit of a third person thing. Yeah. Um, stay level-headed. Listen to what's been said to you. Find out 
the degree, the level of cancer. You know, there's four four different stages. So I was stage two. Um, so some people are stage one, some stage two. Some people get diagnosed at stage three, which is obviously more concerning. The fact that it was quite an aggressive form of cancer, that was the thing that made me think, I want action to happen quite quickly. I don't want to sit about too much debating whether I have surgery or not. So my, my, my immediate feeling was not panic, um, um, but I can understand why it could be. And, uh, and I especially think, um, you know, even as I was treated, there was younger women being treated and there was younger women that still had young children that the thought of having a serious illness when you've got young children, there was one woman that I was treated with that was a single parent. I immediately felt, how lucky am I that I've got a secure, I've got a secure family. I've got two daughters that support me really well. I've got a husband. I've got sisters. I've got a wider community in the yoga the world. I felt real gratitude for what I had that could help. The reason I'm asking is because, as an Ayurvedic practitioner, yeah. myself, every single illness, the more I practice and I have patience, the more I feel like every illness is not random before i before i was you know an ayurvedic before being an ayurvedic practitioner an illness was just kind of like falling from the sky and i'm an unlucky one yeah and then i had those friends with breast cancer specifically um one of them being very clear about oh i'm so unlucky yeah another one handling it more like you feeling like there's unconsciously feel like there's something that says, oh, of course it's happening. Kind of, mm -hmm. I've been myself so, so long, for so long or so much in, in whichever way, and we're going to talk about all this, but I push my, that something like that had to happen kind of thing. And it's almost like within you unconsciously, you have this feeling like you're, you might become your own medicine. I mean, you will need help from outside, but you know, and, and that brings, us to we're going to talk about chemo versus yes. medicine as well but i think like it's very important to talk about you and i you're going to think that i'm banging about that because you and i we discussed that but i think it's it's interesting like how some of my friends with breast cancer were very secretive about it yeah and unwilling to share unwilling to say it mm -hmm. in their work environment with their friends, with, I guess, like very, very close friend and intimate friends. Yes, they would share. You have to kind of thing. You yeah. can't say about it. But with everybody else, there, was, there would be a seal of secrecy upon this breast cancer. And I, I had those conversations saying, why don't you say and that? Those conversations brought me to understand that there was some guilt. Yeah. Sense of responsibility. Like, I am responsible of what's happening to me yeah. and him that's very interesting to me as a therapist yeah. because ayurveda for example is only interested and in, i'm bouncing on what you were saying earlier is mm -hmm. in, in using the symptoms to yeah. understand the nature of the disease the nature the constitution we call it the dosha of the patient but mm. only using those symptoms as a means to understanding the cause, yeah. root cause of the disease. And yeah. it's in Ayurveda, if you don't find out about this root cause of the disease, you will not heal from the disease. Yeah. You have to bring, you have to kind of get to a stage where you are conscious yes. of the reason that led you there. Yeah. And so I think that's the yeah. trick for those people suffering from it. What do you think? I think I think there's 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 two things there that you, you've said. I think um, I think that what happens in our lives does impact on our health. There is there is absolutely no doubt about it. And if I look at my own life, um, certainly um, there was lots of different things that happened in my life, even before this happened to Donald, that were major major stressors. Um, that I didn't at the time, and now, and, and if I think about how I dealt with things in the past, I was much more the sort of person that um, would repress, absolutely, 
paint a picture that everything was perfect, regardless of what was going on in my life, to a degree. And I think that could be linked to even feeling a sense of shame at not managing things in the way that they should be managed. And and as a result of that, holding, holding things. And I, I, I would say that was probably a personality trait of mine from being very young and finding ways of coping with things that if I don't mention it, it really happens. So it became almost a, a denial, not just to other people, but to myself. But, you know, there is a great, a, a great phrase that um, you can't keep depression down. <laughs> um, and also Gabor Mate um, writes a lot about this. And um, very specifically, he, he does write about um, many breast cancer patients that he's treated, probably a lot of people with addiction issues as well. And um, addiction can quite often come out, arise out of um, suppressing things and, and, and masking things. And he, he is in his view that um, a lot of women in particular with breast cancer have been people that generally um, do not speak about things that are problems, brush them over, and and try, and try and behave that life is different to what it really is. And I would say that that was definitely a pattern of mine. In Ayurveda, in Ayurveda the three doshas are involved in cancer, yeah. all cancers, not just breast cancer. Um, in the in the case of breast cancer, pita, which is inflammation, fire. Yeah when pushed to the extreme and kapha like the accumulation of toxins which ama we call it ama undigested thoughts mm -hmm. and uh foods ama the toxins in ayurveda is both um, physical and emotional so keeping things which are not useful to your emotion to your mind to your body will lead to interestingly as well in ayurveda in sanskrit um are you, uh, sorry, cancer means 1,000 problems. <laughs> it's like, yeah. at the same time, there is something needs to get sorted, sort kind of things. We are overwhelmed. Yeah. Depression and the suppression of either of the, the doshas for too long, for a long period of time. To go back on Gabor Mate, he says, most people who get cancer are, most, are more concerned with the emotional needs of others, mm. their own, they have a hard time expressing the yeah. anger. Yeah. Anger, not hanger. That's my French accent. I'm terrible. They have a hard time expressing healthy anger and have the idea that they can't disappoint anybody. Yeah. They feel sad and angry for not being helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would absolutely agree that that would describe a lot of my nature. I think I have ch changed, or I don't know if I've changed, but I've, I recognise it more now, and I, I think I can express myself a little bit more freely now than ever I have done in my life. But this has taken me the best part of 60 years. <laughs> so um, so I, I, would, I, I would absolutely agree that that is certainly or can be a contributing factor. But I, I, I like the idea that in Ayurveda is only understanding it so that we can help treat. I think the other thing that then, the, the, the downside of that is that some people then feel the shame of getting the illness that now will be exposed for being the type of person that that would happen to, rather than yeah. there are other people that can behave in exactly the same way, do all these different things, and have a different constitution that may not then get it. It's so, so almost a shame of our vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. You said yourself when we discussed this, sorry to interrupt if I was, um, I've always been the helper and the eldest of a family of eight. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you became helpless yeah. with the heel of your partner. Yeah. yeah. And suddenly, yeah. so you're yeah. not able to fulfill that role anymore? Is it um, I, well, I didn't necessarily feel helpless with my with Donald. I, I actually felt as if I could be of help to him. I think maybe I've mis, uh, mis, uh, mis said that. Um, I think it was when I was able to do what I could do for Donald, 
I think then that perhaps all my life I'd been in overdrive all of the time and it was almost when I let the brakes off that the illness could almost come up. <laughs> it was it almost felt for me like it was a safe time in my life for this to happen. Oh, interesting. You could allow yourself to be to on the your point, mm -hmm. but not before. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. That's that that is just that is just a sense that came up. And I think that's even why when it happened, although I felt it was an inconvenient time because I wanted to have a happy wedding and stuff like that, which is, which we still did. Um and in all other aspects of my life, it was the perfect time. Mm. There is a perfect time. And immediately I did think I know that it doesn't happen at a perfect time for everybody else, but because it has for me I'm going to try to use this experience when the time is right to be able then to go back into my usual mode of helping others. Yeah. So going back to the choice that one has to make between, yeah. and I, I don't like to call it a choice because I do think that, again, going back, I do think that uh, Ayurveda and natural medicine, Chinese medicine, these types are medicine of balance and bring you back to your own self yeah consciousness of your own balance and this is crucial and i think it should be there but it's also long-term treatments and yeah. when are that's the problem with cancer when you're diagnosed with cancer most of the death rate in cancer comes from very late diagnosis yeah sure. the illness has progressed and so it's so advanced that the the implication of allopathy Mm -hmm. is very useful. It's also interesting, if I may, in the treatment of it, uh, Ayurveda will prescribe strengthening. Uh, we need to strengthen the body at the same time as detoxifying it. But re rejuvenation, like rejuvenation medicines and herbs are used and, and practices. And actually, allopathy comes up with ra radiotherapy and chemo, Yeah. We, yeah, exactly the opposite. Yeah. They, yeah. they weaken you. They weaken your immunity. They weaken yeah. all. That. Yet at the same time, they the point yeah. is destroy in one go, like the cells which are responsible. So, what was your uh, decision? And again, I'm really not opposing the two because I think one is very good in the preservation of health in the remission when we have time and the other one is very efficient when there's an emergency and a life-threatening condition. So what was your yeah. uh, you know, thought process there? Um, it, it was quite interesting um, and, and, and I, kept, I kept quite a good diary quite a lot of the time. Um, so when I was diagnosed at first, um, they said, you know, there was surgery and it'll I, I was fortunate it was a lumpectomy rather than a full mastectomy um, and at the time the, they said really we have to wait till we have that done till we know specifically whether chemo and radiotherapy will be helpful or, 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 or necessary and at that point I just kept a really open mind um, and when, when it, it came back initially they thought it, it might just be radiotherapy that I needed from their side and then they said no we think that um, just the way that the, the cells have moved around and um, that we think that chemotherapy would be beneficial mainly to make sure that your full system is flushed out and um, and to give you a bit better chance of it not coming back as well as as well as making sure that there isn't a residue of it there yeah and it, it My initial reaction was, well, absolutely, I'll take this treatment and at the same time, I'll look into all the other herbs and nutritions that I can take. And just just after we get married, we went on honeymoon and we went to a lovely little uh, cottage up in the north of Scotland. And I did, a, I did a yoga practice, quite a strong yoga practice. And then I did a meditation. And at first, I felt, I felt kind of sad because I thought I won't be able to do this type of yoga for quite a long time. Um, And I was kind of mourning the fact that I wouldn't have that physical strength for some time. And then I did a meditation and I had a really, really strange meditation. And um, at, at the end of the meditation, I actually felt 
really shaky. And it was as if all my organs were jiggling about. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it and saying, don't do this, don't do this. And I, I felt as if I couldn't speak to anybody because I would, I would give away what was going on. And I wanted this to be something that was really about me. And I, I wanted to think what had actually happened. And I thought, what I initially thought was, my body is responding to the fact that I'm going to have this really pervasive treatment now and ruin all the good work that I've been doing for years, all the yoga, all the good um, um, health supplements, all the chanting, meditation, whatever I've been doing, eating well, vegetarian mainly and all of that. And I thought, oh, maybe, maybe my body's saying I shouldn't take this chemotherapy. And I, and I felt, again, this, this, this was a bit of a crisis point because I thought, if I say to my family, if I say to Donald, I'm not going to take chemotherapy, they'll all really worry. And then I thought, I'm not saying anything to anybody. I'm going to sit with this. I'm going to sit with it for a few days. And then what I, what I think I did then was I realised that when I'd been told about the treatment, I hadn't actually thought about it. I just went back in the mode of, yeah, that's what I have to do and that's it. I hadn't actually thought it through properly for myself. But then when I did... Then, then I had that meditation. It was really powerful. It was like the yin and the yang. The oh, don't take it, do take it. Fighting with myself, <laughs> all of that. And then I thought maybe, maybe neither of them are completely right. <laughs> so what? Because I, I was due to start chemotherapy that following week on the Friday. And then I thought I'd spoken to one of my doctors, one what, a friend of mine who's an oncologist, and and the, the 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 bit of hope that she gave me about chemotherapy was she says you know cells die in our body every day, yeah. and then they replenish, so they'll they'll die quicker when you're having chemotherapy, but they will still come back again, and mm. then if other things that help it, that'll be it. So what I decided at that point, and it just really empowered me, was I will take each chemotherapy as it comes, and I will really sit with it. I will watch my symptoms, I'll watch how I respond, and then before I have my next one, I will decide if I feel well enough and strong enough to go for it. So be very in tune with your body, basically. Yeah, and that, that's what Every I did. session at the time, yeah. and just be listening to what the body says after the... Yeah. And so, and, and, and so I really decided then I will keep this diet, I will notice it. So from the first, you know, and then after the first chemotherapy, um, it was about seven days in, I, I did feel pr quite unwell, a bit of inflammation, a um, bit of shakiness. And that was the point where my hair fell out. And it was weird because in my head, I, I didn't think it was going to happen after the first chemo. I thought it would be after the second one. I just kind of made that up. And um, I remember Donald went to school. It was a Wednesday, funny, funny enough, like today. And he went to school as a teacher. And I just felt shivery, shaky. And then at one point, I just did this. just, And I touched my hair and it just came out in clumps. And it was the weirdest thing because... By the next morning, I was teaching yoga and my hairdresser comes to my class. By that morning, I had to put my hair up in a kind of bun because it turned to straw and you, you couldn't touch it. And Alan, who's my hairdresser and a wonderful hairdresser, said, come into the salon and I'll just give you like a little pixie cut. And I did come in. And that was great because I felt as if then I was taking some action around what was going to happen. But the, the strangest thing was, it wasn't just that my hair was coming out, it was like it turned to straw overnight. Mm. And that gave me a bit of a wake up call about chemo as well. I thought, oh my God, look how strong this is, that it, overnight it can, it can do this. But also I thought, it's also killing the cancer. So that is good. So it's, it's hard that I'm going through this, but it, it actually made me think, oh, this is really working through every cell in my body. Because yeah. Only the hair in your head that falls out, it falls out in your nose, it falls out in your eyebrows and your eyelashes, all over your body. Yeah. But I, after about, I, after that happened, then by the next Monday, I started to feel well. And um, and then by the time I was having the next chemo, I was like, do you know what? I'm okay for this. And I actually felt 
maybe joyful is the wrong word, but um, I took my study books in because you have to wait, you don't know what time you're going to get taken at. And I just sat and did my studying. And I thought, while I'm having, because chemo isn't painful. You're, you're getting it, well, not for me anyway. Maybe getting the, the needles in a bit and painful. So I sit, it was a bit like sitting in the dentist, you're on this big chair and then somebody comes and gives you a wee massage and, you know, there's um, the beats in, come round and really help you. Um, and there is a bit of camaraderie in the room because you're in separate cubicles, but you're all having the same treatment. So there's a bit of feeling together on it. Of course. And then... And then I just went through each chemo like that. And then I would start to see the pattern of, I would know the days I was going to feel quite unwell and actually say, right, okay, this is a day that I can joyfully go back to bed and feel not feel guilty about it. And, and actually just tr started to treat it like, I don't have to do anything. I've never in my life felt I don't have to do anything, ever. And it, it, it really taught me a lot about resting when you need it. And, then start to come better for it. So that's it, really listening. Mm -hmm. Thich Nhat Han, you know, the poet. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Thich Nhat Han. Mm -hmm. Me too. He says, he says, listening is loving. Yeah. And when yeah. you start to listen, it's to your own body, I guess. This is, love is there too, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, well, you said something about your haircuts. Yeah, uh-huh. I, I know that, you know, in mythology and there's so much symbolism around the hair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that this is such a, a common thing. When we lose our hair, we feel like, is it because this is the, the visible manifestation of the invasive procedure mm -hmm. or is it something else? And, and how this haircut seem to have been a way to regain control. A yeah. we lose yeah. during illness. Yeah, it, it was it was straight, and I, I do a lot of women actually just shave their own heads and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but for me, it, you know, it's funny because I thought losing my hair was going to be quite a significant thing for me. I had always had blonde curly hair. That was I was kind of known as oh, mornings the one with the blonde curly hair, kind of like or blondish. As I got older, I had to help that, um, and I thought what will it be like to have no hair? And then I've never really had short hair either. And when I got my hair cut really, really short, you know, it was like just round here. I actually, I, I liked the look, you know, um, it was a bit like um, me, the, the Mia Farrow look for a couple of days because then that eventually went away. But there was something that felt amazing about having no hair. I had never had the sensation of getting into the bath, for example, and just doing that and feeling the water completely on your head. <laughs> there was a certain feeling of rebirth with it. Interesting. It was weird. It was weird. But I, I, it, it was also funny because I went to do a headstand because I was still practicing. But it was sore. And I didn't realise that it wasn't just you were losing your hair, but the nerve endings, mm. it, the very ends of your nerves were painful. Then I just put a wee towel down or a wee blanket down and did it anyway. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, but but losing my hair wasn't so. Actually, I felt more losing my eyelashes and my eyebrows because I felt all of a sudden it wasn't I anymore. Felt vulnerable then. Yeah, and I felt I didn't look like me. Um, and um, I, I and I had a wig because when I went in to get my hair cut, Alan had said to me. I've got this wee wig in the background, uh, in the back, if you want to try it. And it was great because it was a little sh short, sharp bob that I'd never had either. And it was quite cute. And sometimes I would use it and sometimes I didn't. I quite liked not using it. And when I taught yoga, when I was at yoga, I never, ever really had the wig. But sometimes if I was out, I just thought, do you know what? I'll put it on. I also kept my head warm in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> so you did, um, talking about remission and everything that helped you now. Mm -hmm. I mean, from what you're telling us, it, you did keep on practicing and yeah. working yeah. yoga and, and giving classes. Yeah. And you said to me that one of the big, big, big help in your remission and mm -hmm. your was your support group. Yeah. It was absolutely. work, yoga, your yeah. students yeah. and fellow yoginis and yogis. Yeah. Hi to all of them who are connected now, I'm sure, listening. Um, can you tell us about this? What, 
what was the most uh, helpful and the most, um, you know, uh, yeah, helpful in the treatment? In yeah. Healing. Uh, and, and healing, um, I think, I, I think you can f feel really disempowered when you have something like cancer that you know that, it, and the treatment can make you feel really disempowered. And I was, to, I cut, there was quite a lot of things. I mean, having having an amazing family was probably first and foremost. You know, being able to surrender, I had never ever surrendered before. Being able to surrender and know that that was the right thing was was a revelation in some ways. But surrendering, not in the sense that I just took to my bed and stayed, think I'm going to stay here until to, until I want to come out. I never felt I wanted to disengage. Um, and, you know, I've, I've taught the same group of yogis for probably 11 years. And, you know, I've got a number of key friends that would stay in the they were in the same yoga place every day you know they had the same mat out in the same place and um and i just get such a sense of 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 love from them and there there's a couple of girls in class one in particular bev who, who was always the person that covered me who had said i had said you know i hope to keep teaching but if i do feel poorly bev will cover even if it was on the morning that I would get up and think, I can't do it. I could phone Bev and she would just step in right away. To be honest, I don't know that I, I think once Nicole, my daughter said, you're too ill this morning, mum. And she phoned <laughs> Bev to teach for me. And I just went back to bed and that was great. So, Is that surrendering you're talking about? Sorry? Is it part of the surrendering you're talking about? I want yeah, to absolutely. Know. That was surrender because normally... Yeah. Yeah. Why do we feel that we have to be there, push our? Yeah. It's this. It's it's almost like we refuse to be weak, yeah. to be vulnerable, isn't it? Is that the uh, sort of thing we're talking about? Yeah, that's that, that's absolutely. It. And then actually that day, the very fact that I went back to bed and had a rest meant the rest of the day was quite pleasant, rather than really really pushing on that day. Um, and, and and that's probably something I'll have to work out all of my life. Isn't it true yoga though? Isn't it like really the definition of true yoga to be reconnected, listening? Yeah. And you know, it's in, sorry, I'm like getting excited. In Ayurveda, it's like the loss of wholesomeness. Yeah. Wholesomeness in relationship, wholesomeness in foods, wholesomeness. Yeah with your own self the yeah. yeah direction yeah vulnerability you're talking about is the surrendering of no i can't actually work anymore i could just i can't do that today i just can't do that today i have done i've done all i can but also learning not to wait till it's at that stage you know just sometimes just saying actually maybe i could do it but I know that actually if I don't do it, it will feel a bit better. So that, for me, you know, is, as I said, is still a bit of work. But um, that feeling of surrender and being vulnerable and allowing other people to help was great. And Because I find it frustrating when I want to help somebody that, despite the fact they might need help, won't take it. And I think it's because I see it in myself. <laughs> so it's not a judgment about the person. It's just, yeah, it's just, and people, and you know, people do want to help. And it, then that adds to the whole community thing of it. It was like, we're kind of in it together. I'm the person with cancer. And it's like, when Donald was ill, he was the person that had the illness. And I felt, I know the things that I can do to support that. Then I had to have that reversed and let other people help me. Mm. It, it, it was, between the two of us having these different illnesses at different times, that was a great way of squaring or, or making the whole yin and yang thing really work. Um, and, and to me, uh, cancer has been such a great teacher. Such a great teacher. And, you know, and, and, and I can say I'm honestly glad that I had it.
Yeah. And I had it at the time that I had it in the circumstances, and that's not to say that it's the same for everybody. Um, and people have much tougher journeys and different things. And as I said, I just want to say that it doesn't always have to be viewed as the worst thing that can happen to you. It for the for the people who are suffering from cancer and are listening to these talks or will be listening to these yeah. talks, I I think I mentioned this to you when we had our first chat. Yeah. There's this guy, and I mentioned in, in many of these talks, actually, because it feels like every illness, cancer or not, cancer yeah. being one of the, obviously, the most fear one, feared one, talks about the the hero's journey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now this is such an initiation where there is a call and you are called to change something and you will resist this call for the longest time and you think you can keep on going as you have been and forever you go on and you go on and then some, at some point something happens such as illness. Yeah. That's going to force you to, to inquire. Yeah. And, and this is also what Gabor Maté is somehow called, you know, compassionate inquiry to Absolutely. go back to the roots of what brought you here. Mm -hmm. And then the, the following of that um, journey is full of trials and tribulation. But then something happens, something spiritual brings you back. And yeah. maybe your meditation in Scotland that day in this cottage. Yeah just, you know, bring you to some kind of... It's, yeah, do you know, it's, it's absolutely that. And I, I think one of, the, one of the things for me is, I think I've always been like that. I really have to get the hard knock in the head <laughs> before I take, pay attention. And that is true. And it's been true of emotional things that have happened to me in my life as well. But if I get the knock in the head, I do start to listen. So... Cancer is something that kind of stops you in your tracks because you can, I, I can't, I couldn't just talk my way out of it. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't wiggle out. I couldn't wiggle. There was no wiggle room left. And it was like, okay, right, hands up. What have I got to do? And, um, and, and the thing is, because I then, my word would be acceptance. And sometimes people maybe look at acceptance as a weak thing. Because I could accept fully that I had cancer, that became the point, even though I was still to go through lots of treatment, that became the point that I knew I would start to grow. Mm. Because this is where I am. These are all the things that have probably contributed to it, some things more than others. Now it's got to stop. <laughs> now I've got to stop and I do have to listen. And, and there was something so... I, I, and I think you touched on it there. It, it became a spiritual journey. But the other thing that it, it really made me realise is I am mortal. I'm not 21. I'm not this age. Even if you are 21, it doesn't matter what age you are. This life is precious. Mm -hmm. Even the days that felt like real crap are precious because that is the day that I'm living. This is my experience today, whatever that is. What can I do with this day? What can I learn from it? It might be that I have to learn that this is the day that I can only be in bed and do nothing else and just let people bring me soup and let them look after me. The next day is not going to be the same. Mm. And the journey from that is the journey of a full lived experience every day. And this is, you know, this is back to Thich Nhat Hanh. Every new inhale is a new beginning. Every exhale is a chance to let go. And every today changes yesterday and tomorrow. Ab absolutely. But the, the fact of the matter is, for so many of us, we're either living in the past in the sense of, I wish I'd done it this way or I wish I'd done it that way, or we're fretting about what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. And it's not about not thinking about these things. Oh. But we're doing that or that. We're missing this moment. This I not to be in like regrets, yeah, regrets of the past and fear of the future. Absolutely. Um, you said um, uh, surrendering, yeah, and acceptance. Yeah. Was 
And it's interesting because through my experiences over the last four years of India, of Ayurveda, of yoga, of everything that I've been doing, I never understood detachment. Yeah. This very strong principle of detachment. I, you have to be detached. Yeah. All right. So if I'm detached, I'm not doing this. I'm not involved. I'm, you have to be detached, but involved. Yeah. How, how do you do this? I didn't understand. It took me so long. And for me, the best definition be, became detachment is acceptance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Detachment yeah. was just that. Acceptance. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because I, I used to have the same um, issue around detachment. Um, when I would be studying Buddhism, um, and, you, and and you know, I still, I still, I'm not Buddhist um, in in terms of following it, really, but that is much more my leaning than than anything else in terms of a spiritual. <laughs> and detachment was the thing that always got me. How can I be detached? Because I love. So if you love, you can't be detached. But what, 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 what it made me recognise was there are things that I will be attached to. I will always be attached to the love that I have for my children. I will always be attached to the love that I have for my family and those around me. That means that I know that I will, in this life, have a degree of suffering. Exactly. Because if things happen to them, I feel it. But now that I've navigated that and I recognise that there will be that, I can then detach myself from other things that are not so personal, if, that, if that's the right way to describe it. So cancer happened to me. It didn't define me. So I could separate the illness from me. I Very important. Crucial. Crucial. Yeah. So once I separated it and realised that it was in my body and it was going to be here for whatever length of time, but my job was to work with it and then to work it out of my body. Yeah here forever and you know but without getting worried about is it still here is it this day or is it that day <laughs> it's come to a point and then also even whilst I was ill there was days I felt perfectly well perfect mm -hmm. even in the middle of chemotherapy some mornings I would wake up and think I could change the world mm -hmm. and do all my writings and I'd write all about the yamas and the yamas and I would work out all the different philosophical links that I could and then go back to bed because then I'd exhausted myself. But um, so it was great. It was great. Lots of it. Yeah. It's like, it's also like not identifying with the illness. Yeah. And I said, oh, yes, it's crucial. I'm, I, I don't become my illness. I am not my illness. At the same time, the illness is also me. Like, I think it's interesting not to identify and not to become this, like the cancer person or the whatever illness that is actually. But at the same time, treating it like an enemy and treating it like something outside of us that again, fell from the sky, I have no, is also, I think we talk a lot when it, about nurturing. Again, that goes back to what you were just saying can't live in the regrets of what happened last and in the fear of what happened tomorrow. It's, it's very tricky. That nuance as well is very... Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, absolutely. And, and what I would say is, whilst I said I am not the cancer, mm -hmm. I recognised it was, it was within me. What that was teaching me was, I have to really, really take care of myself. Properly take care of myself. And that's... that's where the softness towards myself came in much, much, much better. And even, for example, if I was doing, like, one of the one of the effects of chemotherapy is your skin gets really, really tender to the point where you feel, if you pulled on your fingers, that you could pull the skin off the fingers. Mm. That didn't happen, but, you know, you can get, you know, you can almost get sores and stuff like that. And I was doing something one day where I was trying to do a balance and take my toe and stand up. And I thought, oh, this is actually really pulling on my skin. And then I came out of the posture and I thought, well, what I need to do is get really nice oil or shea butter and just sit and softly massage myself. But as I'm doing it, pay attention to it, not just like slap the cream on and get onto something else. It was like, right, so now I'm massaging my hands. Now I'm doing my arm, now I'm doing my upper arm, and now I'm doing doing my breast, doing the back of my body. 
and being in contact with my body. And then, so then cancer became the teacher of compassion to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That is so beautiful. Maureen, I'm very touched, you know. It's very, uh, thank you for, I should have started by saying that. Thank you for for sharing so candidly and openly. Um, I think it's the your, the healing is in all these emotions. I think we're touching upon a very crucial, you know, uh, the, again, the cause, the root, the deep, the deep healing is there, I believe. So thank you for that. Can, can, because I'm looking at the time already, I could spend another hour with you. <laughs> to, for the people who are suffering from the illness, would you please list, you know, the things which really helped you? Yeah. Give pointers yeah. To, to what really helps you move to the next step and to the next step and overcome. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, first of all, things like going to the hospital, taking somebody with you, this sounds really crazy, but taking somebody with you that can, especially when you're getting any kind of diagnosis or what's, what's happening next, somebody that can listen a little bit more detached because when we're in it, sometimes all we hear are the scary words and we don't maybe realise that the person that's speaking to us has been more hopeful than, than we realise. And we sometimes miss things like the dates and what's happening and all the rest of it. So get somebody that you really trust to be with you. And if you don't know anybody, and some people might not know anybody, contact one of the great agencies, you know, Macmillan, Beatson, within the UK, there are lots of people that will buddy you up with somebody that will help you. Do not feel that you're alone with this because we're never actually alone. Mm. That's probably the first thing. Eat really well, eat as well as you can. A vegetarian diet is much more healthy, much more easy to digest and not expensive. So if you can, eat organically. And I, I did all of these things. Um, the Very awesome foods. Awesome. Yeah. A lot yeah. of food. Um, have, I, I was having grated ginger, turmeric, black pepper in my porridge in the morning because build it, because it, cancer is an inflammatory illness and you want to bo bo uh, reduce that. So ginger, um, turmeric, um, black pepper together are a really good combination. Um, as so I said, that's the black pepper though, because that's a very, that's a very pita food. Yeah. And someone should have like, avoid tomatoes, everything that's too spicy, too punchy. Yeah. Turns out that those three uh, herbs you mentioned, or that you know, they they have other properties, but they are also quite full of fire. But uh -huh. they burn the toxins and these kind of things in a way. Like if I'm kind of taking. So the the, uh, the other things I took was um, Rosilia rhodia, um, which is a, a an Ayurvedic herb, and they do say that that helps with um, depression and with fatigue, because you do get pretty fatigued because everything's getting stripped out of you. And if you get really fatigued, that can actually make your mood low and, and lead perhaps to depression. I found that really, really helpful. Um, and I didn't take it in tablet form. I got it in the actual powder form. Yeah. And it's disgusting. <laughs> it's very often the case. <laughs> you only need a tiny little bit. And what I would do is put, just put it in a little bit of warm water and get it swallowed over. And then it goes into your system quite easily. Ashwagandha is also good. Um, then just things like chamomile tea that keep the body nice and calm. Um, avoiding caffeine. I would still have maybe one cup of coffee a day. But sometimes with the metallic taste that you get from chemo and stuff, your taste buds change anyway. Trying to get good sleep. So even if you don't sleep very well, napping during the afternoon when you're ill really helps. So taking good rest, um, doing gentle yoga, stretching a little bit to just ease the body out a little bit, um, doing passive sort of a stretches, doing things to help your lymphatic system. So things like legs up the wall, very, very restful, but also takes the fluids out of the ankles, lifting your arms up, so lying on your back with your arms and legs in the air, even supporting yourself can help your lymphatic system. So for example, 
if you get lymph nodes removed, um, quite often you get swelling in your arm, lymphedema. Um, so doing things that actually allow the body, the the blood to flow without exerting yourself can be really, really helpful. So slow practice, slow yoga practice, eating well, med meditate. Certainly for me, meditation really works. People that find it difficult to meditate find a way of doing a moving meditation. Inhale, I lift my arms up. Exhale, I take them down. Do, do guided meditations. There are so many of them. Yeah. Use Thich Nhat Hanh, absolutely brilliant for helping us to live in the present moment. He's got tons of little mantras. Inhale, I'm energising my body. Exhale, I'm letting go of tension. And that then is an act of love to our bodies, just as you said. Seek out people that help you. They can help. Um, yeah, the Beats in McMillan, places like that would do free massages. Yeah. You, you also can get help with finances, you know, people that are struggling with money, if they're off work, they can help you to pay bills and stuff like that. So there's a, it's, it's so massive. Um, yeah, there's yeah. just can be done. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, please do, because I'd be more than happy to give little bits of advice. Um, and in January, I'm hoping to run some trainings and workshops and things that will be of help to people, um, so. so. Just on that, I'm gonna interrupt you one minute to say to whoever is watching, um, we can find you on the Tapo Tribe Facebook page where announced this, there's all your links. Yeah. Uh, Yoga Barn and to uh, the classes and to be in touch with you and your Instagram as well, which we have here, so that's not a problem. And do you treat uh, and help women with cancer specifically? Um, yes. Um, at the moment, I've only done it on a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and going forward, um, because being in community is so, so important when you've got some, an illness like this, um, what I'm hoping to do that in January is to do something a bit bigger where we can have people face-to-face -face or even on Zoom because who knows how, how things will be. But to run sessions where I do one one-to-one -one with each person so that I've got an idea about yeah. where they really are. Then to run classes where people can do what they wish to do within that, what feels right at the time. So again, really thinking into what will be helpful for me today not what I think I should be doing in this practice. And then always being available for one-to-one -one advice. Because I think the combination of being with people that have got a similar complaint, you can chat to them about it and even have a bit of a moan and groan about what your treatment's like. And that can then help you. And other people have got great ideas. It's not just like, as a teacher, you've got a good idea. People, even students in class, tell, tell me things all the time that really help me. So, so um, yeah. So I'm hoping to do things that are broader and also it keeps it more affordable when people aren't having to do things on a one-to-one -one basis. So a combination of things and if possible, I'll be able to even, maybe even raise some funds and do things for free as well and do some talks or lectures that are also free because one yeah. of the things that bothers me is that lots of people from low income, different backgrounds have these and don't they can't even afford to take Ayurvedic treatments or different things like that. So working working as best as I can to find ways around everything that is potential problem. Yeah. And we are closer to each other because I so want to run like a free clinic in Ayurveda. You know, like it's it used Ayurveda used to be like that. You would not yeah. pay the practitioner, you would only pay for the medicine, which are yeah. another conversation, but very difficult to get proper medicine that's not too expensive. But you know we got to do is what we got to do, but I'm available as well. Exactly. Um, and for any kind of budget, I think it's important. We are here to help, right? That's, that, that is it. If we've had a journey, uh, you know, to me, it, there's a duty, a duty for me now sure. to go you know, free when I can and as cost effectively as I can at other times. And for people that can afford to pay, that's great because they can then, supplement people that can't afford to pay and stuff um but also i will be in london in january so maybe we will get a wee catch up <laughs> here you go we'll do something um <laughs> uh, what do you want to say to conclude on this talk like last time we talked you said um 
the, there is a need to change the story about cancer. It's not about giving it the boot. Yes. Yes, I, I think that um, what, what, one, of, one of the big things for me is a lot of cancer campaigns um, are, are, are quite aggressive campaigns and, you know, and, you know, kick cancer into touch and all the rest of it. You know, we are born with the potential for cancer in every single body. And, and, and for me, it's much more about working holistically with our bodies, not being afraid of a diagnosis as such, recognising that it's came to visit us for whatever reason that has happened in our life. It doesn't mean that it's going to have the outcome that was sometimes pr 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 proclaimed all of the time. We can do a lot to help ourselves and to help ourselves during the journey not just after it. It's, it's, we don't put our lives on hold while we have cancer. Mm. Do, have, have a great life during it. Rest when you need to. Do all the things that you need to do. But look for the golden moments all of the time. Seek out people. Seek out people that are like-minded and, 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 sh and share your story. And don't, and don't feel shame. Definitely don't feel shame about it. Um, and, and the more we just bring it into normal conversation, the more the fear of it loses its power, yeah. I think. I think. Um, so. so acceptance. Acceptance. Understanding that this is a part of us that needs healing. Yeah. Changing uh, something rather than keeping on fighting something. Yeah. That's yeah. like it was external or something that's it's a yeah. part that needs healing and care and compassion. Yeah rather than a fight mm. oneself, really. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we can't fight ourselves. And I think it is a great opportunity mm. to really practice self-compassion, self-kindness and self-love, things that we don't like in our language at times. Mm. Maureen, I don't know how to thank you for spending the time. I might call you again because considering all these specialties you have, I'm sure there is <laughs> more that we can discuss. <laughs> anyway. It's been great, and I really do hope that anybody that has been listening um, have got some from it, um, and never ever feel alone because you're just not. You're just not. Thank you so much. This is very inspiring. I don't have breast cancer, at least I don't think I do right now, and yet there's a lot of things that you say which applies to our everyday life, like uh, oneself to be acceptant, vulnerable, and, and I think, and, and, and even in the healing process, caring for oneself rather than fighting an illness. So Maureen, thank you for everyone here. Um, Louise is saying beautiful, inspirational Instagram live talk with Maureen. What a privilege to hear her life journey and positive wisdom. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> you have some fans here. And <laughs> I think this is this beautiful community that you've um, you've created for yourself, and it's just very beautiful and very inspiring. So, thank you, Maureen, and thank you everyone for watching. Uh, anybody has a comment? Because we are late anyway. Now it's the longest talk ever. Nice <laughs> me somehow. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we're there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone that's been listening and yeah, just we're all good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, Thank you. People can get in touch yes. and, and, and help. you can help them in their remission as well. Yeah. Um, lots of love, everyone. Lots of love to you, Maureen. Thank you again for being part of the tribe. And <laughs> I have a bit more together. Yeah, yeah, and I'd be happy to talk to you again if it ever comes up. But thank you, and thank you for creating this environment where people can can share different experiences and different stories. And um, my friend Berenice was on um, previously, and we met through yoga therapy. And it's just such a great world where we just share our vulnerability and share what's going on with us, and and the hope that we all work collectively for the common good. Yes, it's important because I do believe that what every illness has in common is this lack of control suddenly. Yeah. This immense lack of control and having this community and 
hopefully the tribe talks are an infinite tiny speck yeah. that a bit of hope and other ways of healing yourself is the objective it's very important i think yep. okay thank you so and uh very soon i hope keep on doing the great work you're doing thank you thank you very much and thank you everyone again okay i'll let you finish the meeting because i don't know what to do <laughs> i will stop <laughs> i don't want to do that's the problem lots of love oh thank you so much Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.